Welcome to another edition of Engineering Influence, a podcast from the American Council of Engineering Companies. Today, we're going to be looking at a subject that's a little bit more wide-ranging than we have in past episodes. We're going to be looking at the role of the activist engineer and the overall role of engineering in society, especially a rapidly changing society. And to do that, we're going to be talking to two individuals who are engaged with the Engineering Change Lab. The Engineering Change Lab is a new nonprofit that's focused on the future of engineering. Its mission is to be the catalyst for change within the industry, helping it contribute at the highest possible level in addressing the challenges of the 21st century. I'm pleased to be joined by Mike McMeekin. He is the executive director of the lab, and Darshan Karwat. He is the assistant professor, School for the Future of Innovation in Society at Arizona State University. Darshan's work is centered around the concept of activist engineering. And he asked the question, what's the real problem we're looking at and does it require an engineering solution? So Mike, let's start with you. Let's, let's get into what the Engineering Change Lab is. What's its mission? How did it come about? Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, um, Engineering Change Lab USA is a new nonprofit uh, that came about uh, you know, a little over three years ago, the 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 uh, genesis of Engineering Change Lab came from within ACEC, uh, a number of leaders who knew each other uh, and had been working on and, and talking and thinking about uh, issues related to the future of engineering. And uh, like I said, a, a little over three years ago, we decided to uh, see if there was support for an organization that was looking at the future. Uh, it has proven to be so, and about a year and a half ago, uh, we became an official 501c3 organization. To uh, you know, understand what we're all about, I guess you have to frame what the future is all about. And um, what we believe is that, first of all, technology is having a major impact on the world, obviously, at an accelerating pace. Uh, and technology will have that same type of impact on the engineering industry, potentially in disruptive ways. And then you need to combine that with what society is facing nowadays, major challenges like climate change, population growth, urbanization, waste, stress on natural resources, and then uh, the events of this summer have elevated the need for an, a more equitable society to the list of challenges we face. So Engineering Change Lab USA is all about preparing engineers and engineering organizations for this future and contributing in the future at a higher and higher level. And Darshan, I want to make sure that I get your full title correct here because I know that you are uh, uh, both uh, an assistant professor at the School for the uh, Future of Innovation in Society and the Polytechnic School at Arizona State University. So I want to make sure I get that in there correctly. But uh, how did you get involved with the lab? Well, actually, I was going to start off by just thanking Mike for all of these amazing opportunities that uh, connecting with him has, has led to. Um, I uh, was connected to Mike um, at some level fairly organically. Um, I think there was an email that went out or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Some kind of organic connection, the way in which um, a lot of my life tends to work. <laughs> um, uh, we're involved in similar circles or we know similar folks. And um, after connecting with him uh, and Kyle Davey, uh, a colleague of his, uh, they invited me to speak at the Engineering Ideas Institute Summit that was held this summer in August. And that was really an opportunity to uh, share a little bit more with Mike and uh, the folks that he's connected to more about the ideas that I've been thinking about. And that's just led to continued conversations over the past several months. Now, I know your work focuses in on the role of the activist engineer. What does that mean and how does that translate into reality. Wonderful, yeah. Um, let me start off by saying that engineering has always been about values and advancing values. Whether we like it or not, or whether we acknowledge it or not, um, 
engineering is a political process driven by certain norms and values, certain things that we like to see in the world. And so uh, the agenda for what engineering does or different kinds of engineering do um, has always been um, a place for the competition of ideas. You know, there are certain things that we want to advance in the world. Um, and there are certain things that we might not want to advance in the world. So if we, if we take the example of, you know, providing electricity to every single person in America, let's just take that as an example. That's a, that's a goal. That's a vision. That's a set and it embodies a set of values, right? We feel like people should have access to electricity, right? Um, so I want to sort of uh, preface, preface my, my answer by by stating that engineering is not just about the solving of equations, but about the advancement of values and goals. So given that context, um, uh, activist engineering is simply uh, the idea that um, engineers can ask questions about what they do um, and what the values and goals of what they're engaged in are and that it's important for engineers to understand that. And it's important for engineers to not simply view themselves as cogs in a machine following orders, designing things that they might not really have full knowledge of or control over, but rather to have more agency over the kinds of things that they design and build. So the word activist, um, you know, can sort of rub some folks the wrong way, uh, but it's simply to highlight the fact that a lot of times, um, and, you know, research bears this out as well, that engineers uh, tend to go through their educational process and then work in context that limits their ability to ask questions about what they do and why they're doing it. Um, and, and so the, simply the act of questioning why they're doing what they're doing, understanding more fully what the problem they're working on is, is a, a, you know, a political act at some level, right? Mm -hmm. and, and asking questions is what the activism is all about. You raise a really interesting point because we've been having some discussions with especially the ACEC Research Institute on the future of engineering and what does that look like? And some of our experts have talked about the need to push for a more well-rounded engineer, someone who is both talented in the hard sciences that you need to be a professional engineer, but is also skilled in the softer sciences, maybe has a background or a minor in the social sciences, political science, economics, philosophy, someone who can have that understanding or a broader perspective on how engineering decisions impact society and how societal change drive design considerations. In your position at Arizona State University, you have a kind of a front row at seeing what this new cohort, these younger students are interested in. And why don't you get an idea from you? You know, what are you seeing? Um, are you seeing this kind of push for engineering students to also have this well-rounded education that, that balances the hard and the soft um, sciences and studies. You know, is that something which you're seeing or, or is there a trend there? I uh, would love to get your perspective on that. Great, Great questions. questions. And um, I'm not sure we have enough time to actually unpack <laughs> the question. We might just have, have to do another show. I mean, we might have to, this might just be the first of-, of I, Hey, I'm looking forward to it already. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, let me just start off by um, stating some things that are coming to light through some research and, and how we um, understand the ways in which engineering students go through college. Um, uh, a lot of engineering students enter college thinking that th they can use their technical skills to make a positive impact on the world more and more research is showing that as students go through their engineering education, they in fact lose their concern for public good, public welfare, and so on. Um, that has um, a, a certain set of um, synergistic challenges associated with it, particularly as it comes to questions of uh, you know, diversity of idea and, and diversity of folks who see themselves in engineering. We see that um, 
women tend to leave engineering um, through their educational process. We see that African Americans and Native Americans might tend to um, leave engineering as well. So it, it sort of creates a bit of a homogeneity in the kind of folks who end up uh, pursuing engineering long term. Um, so let's just start with, however, um, the recognition that engineers, or as I should say, students enter education, their education wanting to make a positive impact on the world. Um, and that, you know, sort of um, the way in which edu the educational system has been constructed or sort of organically evolved, at some level, it beats that concern or willingness to um, engage in public welfare related issues out of them. So, you know, tie that to issues of student debt, the limited kinds of opportunities that exist for students once they do graduate, it sort of creates um, a, a set of conditions in which the status quo maintains itself, you know, yeah. and, you know, the, the, the kinds of engineers that were created a few years ago are still the kinds of engineers that are created today. At the same time, um, I, from my experiences, know that more and more engineering students are very dissatisfied with the opportunities that they are presented with um, for their roles um, as practicing engineers. They want to deploy their skills in, in ways that address fundamental challenges that society is facing related to climate, hunger, poverty, what you name it. Um, the task for us, I think, for not only educators, but also for those who employ these engineers, you know, companies, firms, government, um, nonprofits, is to, um, to shape shift in a way that creates more opportunities for these students to, to live their passions and live their values. Um, so I, I don't think that our education system is for engineers is taking these questions as seriously as it should be. Um, you know, I think a lot of the, um, and you know, cut me off if I'm talking too long. No, here. It's a, it, you're, <laughs> no, you're, um, you're raising some good points here. Um, the, uh, a lot of the good ideas, and these are ideas that Mike and Engineering Change Lab are doing a tremendous job at trying to highlight, a lot of these good ideas and thinking and simply just the questioning about what engineering is for and why we need to do it, unfortunately, is at the margins of engineering education. Um, so, you know, you started off your question by talking about the importance of, quote unquote, like more well-rounded mm -hmm. engineers. In f I would argue that we have done a great job at trying to figure out how to teach students how to solve the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, uh, what is more important in my mind now is actually under giving s students a better understanding of the history, the philosophy, the social impacts of engineering, t training them in things like sociology or... Yeah or philosophy so that they understand why they're doing engineering and what the long-term implications of, of engineering are. Yeah. Engineering does a great job at um, what I call um, ahistoricity mm -hmm. and um, apoliticism. Yeah. Ahistoricity is simply the notion that um, we, every challenge is a challenge for now rather than recognizing the fact that a lot of the social environmental challenges that we face today are caused by engineering, yeah. right? Climate change is a problem that has been caused by engineering, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to recognize that. Um, it's not to say that, um, you know, like it, sort of painting everybody with the broad strokes of the breast saying everything is quote unquote bad, but we, understanding that history is important for us to think about how we respond effectively to climate change. Yeah. It's not simply about the design of technologies. It's about how we shape society. Yeah. Now, Mike, I want to get your take on this. Uh, how does the industry respond to these pressures? Well, I, um, I've always had the viewpoint, Jeff, that uh, businesses operate with a big circle of stakeholders that, that need to be considered. And th this is a fundamental question that business schools deal with, but engineering businesses are uh, just like lots of other businesses. We have a group of stakeholders. Traditionally, 
it's the uh, employees of the organization or primarily the shareholders or owners or investors. But the, the business of the future, I think, will need to recognize a much broader sphere of stakeholders that uh, includes the earth, you know, as one of our stakeholders and the communities that we operate in and, and recognize in recognizing those broader range of responsibilities that then uh, impacts business strategies mm -hmm. and it impacts the engagement of people that that work in your firm as I think parallel with what Darshan said is going on in the educational system, we are producing employees of the future who have a bigger interest in working for companies that have a meaningful purpose. So we need to recognize that. Uh, we, we've heard from the National Academy of Engineering at our Engineering Change Lab USA events, and, and what we've learned kind of goes along with what Darshan said. Uh, very well, well, you know, there's a large percentage of the public that doesn't understand what we do in engineering. And there's about half the public who think we do harm, as, as Darshan indicated. And so right away, we, we're, we're losing, we're, we may be losing young people mm -hmm. who want to make a difference mm -hmm. in their careers. And yeah. even, even those that we do bring in that have that interest, then we beat it out of them to some mm -hmm. extent. So those are concerns for the future of engineering. And it almost seems like there is a pivot point happening because, you know, there is that feeling that younger engineers want to change the world. But at the same time, you know, we see the studies that show that firms that embrace this idea of diversity and try to expand the tent of talent that they have, not just on, you know, the hot button topics of gender diversity or, or, or ethnicity what have you, but socioeconomic diversity, diversity of where you went to school, geographic diversity, that that all matters as well. And what we've seen is that the firms that actually do embrace this and get a more diverse team of talent to pitch work or work on a projects, you have all these different viewpoints that can help uh, create novel solutions to challenges and generally come with stronger presentations than the firms that don't do this, uh, that the firms that actually do have uh, diverse talent tend to actually have stronger revenue numbers. Uh, so this pivot point does have a business justification, right? I mean, there is a business case for this. There's definitely a business case to this, yeah. yes. Now, Darshan, I want to kind of pivot over to one of our main focuses at ACEC, and that's to represent the business interests of engineering. And we do that through advocacy in, in Congress and among state legislatures. And, you know, government isn't always the fastest to adopt new technologies or, or to see exactly the value of innovation. It takes some time for them to kind of get it while the private sector is, you know, full speed ahead. You know, how do we bridge the divide between uh, communicating the interest of the engineer or the role of the activist engineer in the public policy space? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> Loaded question, well, I, I mean, know. I think, uh, you know, just these uh, conversations that have started over the last several months uh, around antitrust and the large tech firms in, in Silicon Valley, I think highlight the extent to which uh, folks in Washington, particularly elected officials, are in the dark and know very little about the ways in which technological systems are designed and what their actual impacts are on society. There are huge chasms in my mind uh, to be uh, uh, bridged between just the accelerating pace of technological development and the widespread impacts of technology and our ability to um, hold techn technological firms or engineering firms, because they're all engineering firms, um, accountable to society. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can simply just watch some of the, the questioning of, um, of tech firm leaders to show the um, lack of literacy at some level. Yeah. 
around engineering um, on Capitol Hill. Mm-hmm. You raise a good point because that is an area where education needs to be increased. And, you know, it's also that opportunity, and we talk about this a lot, that engineers are also thought leaders. They are experts in their field. They are able to provide commentary on things because they have the technical know-how and wherewithal uh, to really step in and say, you know, here's a challenge. Now, here's a, here's a solution. And I guess the challenge that engineers have in general is that, you know, we're not always the loudest voices in the room. We're not the ones to take immediate credit. Mm-hmm. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, I, I think you've you hit on something really important here, that this is this great opportunity for not only engineering firms, but for, you know, anybody across the entire engineering community. You know, we, we live in this world that polit- politically, um, policy takes a backseat to your tribe, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, political decisions are primarily made on what tribe you identify yourself with, not on a specific policy. But engineers are in this position of having the scientific background mm-hmm. to understand you know, issues like climate change and, and resource consumption and waste, but also the, the practical skills to solve some of those problems. Mm-hmm. And, and, and if we can play a greater role in getting the public operating from a common set of facts, yeah. what comes out of that is great engineering opportunities mm-hmm. to solve those problems. So it's what we are in a great position to have influence and to benefit yeah. from, from that. Absolutely. And especially today, I mean, if anybody's seen the Netflix documentary, A Social Dilemma, uh, <laughs> That's you know frightening. I mean, the fact that we have become reliant on on social media, and a lot of people are getting their news and information from social media, and it's a platform that isn't so much to get you the best content as it is to get you the most engaging content, which means that uh, sometimes the most engaging content is not all accurate. It's 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 the false information, the fake news out there, and that gets spread faster. The speed of false information is much faster than the speed of accurate information. And as engineers, we consider ourselves trusted advisors to our clients. We can also be trusted advisors to society in general. And this is where I guess you know Darshan's idea of the activist engineer comes into play, of of being willing to speak up when something is completely incorrect, and you know, showing that expertise still matters because largely around us with the advent of social media and the proliferation of um, different channels to get information of, it's almost like the death of expertise that we're seeing around us. And, you know, engineers are experts and, and we have this great opportunity to be able to clarify incorrect information, uh, provide counter arguments or counter data to help dispel incorrect information. It's not an easy thing to do, but, you know, we're well positioned to do it. Yeah. Um, gosh. Um, <laughs> I, they're just, you know, it's... it's, it's it, it, I, a- I think, Jeff, you mentioned that movie, A Social Dilemma. To me, that was, I, I, I watched that, and, and it was this great, example of really the um, misuse, I guess I'll use the mm-hmm. word misuse of engineering talent mm-hmm. uh, that to, to a use that really is harmful, is turning out to be harmful and could have been applied in, in so many different ways uh, to provide benefit rather mm-hmm. than harm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I want to build off of that and, and what Mike laid the groundwork for by talking about this opportunity for us to, to do something different. Um, I will s- go off of my um, sort of anecdotal experience here and say that, in fact, a lot of practicing engineers were part of firms and corporations and sort of um, anonymous, you know, anonymous engineers <laughs> working in these large companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, themselves want, I'm sure that, you know, um, an engineer who is sitting in a basement somewhere designing a little part of a large system 
didn't get into engineering because that's what they thought they were going to do. Um, and, and so, you know, talking to some of my friends who are involved in doing work that they didn't want to sign up for, um, sort of goes to show the extent to which even practicing engineers, not just students, right? Not just the, the millennials and Gen Z student, uh, folks, but rather practicing engineers who are, you know, maybe even midway through their careers want to do something different. And I think the opportunity needs to be discussed um, honestly and critically, uh, particularly as it questions the underlying motives and values for why engineering has been done in this particular way um, in the first place. Um, and, and so, you know, tying this back to activist engineering, you know, if we, we know that um, well-defined problems can lead to well-defined interventions, right? Engineers understand that intuitively. Um, this is about defining the problems that we face as a society differently. And if we, um, if we frame these problems differently and if engineers understand uh, the problems differently, we will be designing different kinds of interventions and solutions to these problems, which yeah. ties back to your point, Jeff, about uh, the diversity of teams as well. This isn't just about, you know, making sure that there are women on teams or like African Americans on our teams. Uh, certainly, that is important, but it's not just about creating a space in which people feel comfortable mm -hmm. in intra a firm, like in a company or in an organization, um, but it's rather about understanding the perspectives that they bring to the problems that are being faced, yeah. different kinds of questions that they might ask, which lead to different kinds of solutions. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you've heard of the term like environmental justice, which basically yeah. talks about um, the differential impacts of different kinds of infrastructures on different groups of people. So if we think about water infrastructure in Flint, for example, and the way in which, you know, ostensibly a, a majority black community was poisoned. Um, that's an environmental justice question that is that in which water infrastructure and the work of engineers is deeply implicated. Mm -hmm. um, those are questions that engineering firms need to be thinking about yeah. and, um, and designing around. Um, and so as we think about the opportunities that, um, that are there, it's important that we are honest about the extent to which these opportunities really um, take engineering in a different kind of direction than the direction it's currently in. Because once we do start asking questions about you know, how black people might be affected differentially than white people, for example, you know, that can lead to uncomfortable places. Mm -hmm. um, and we should be willing to have those kinds of conversations. Creating the space for those kinds of conversations is actually something that Mike and I have been talking about, which I think um, recognizes this willingness within engineering firms to take these ideas a little bit more seriously. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a huge opportunity here to do things differently. And I think for the better, it's all yeah, for the better. Absolutely. And Mike, I think this goes back to your point, you know, we're like, you know, a lot of times these decisions are made by, you know, exactly which, you know, which political tribe you belong to, right? Where, where, where are you seeing the world? And a lot of these issues, environmental justice and, and social justice, they're, they become, you know, the terms themselves and, 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 mm -hmm. and I guess the larger debate going on in society is, like I say, extremely politically charged. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of engineers don't touch them because of the political connotations that they have, right? So how do we take these issues and we neutralize the political charge here because when you talk about these larger issues like the water issue in flint or electricity uh, distribution mm -hmm. not only you know in in developing countries but then you have you know uh poor or or rural yes. america you know access to broadband perfect example yes huge um, issues yeah. huge yeah. issue right and they have an engineering solution right and so like, how do we get to the point where we can you know like i said uh, decharge this politically so that, you know, an engineer can look say, okay, here's a problem and we have a solution. Well, I think, I think what we are capable or, or could be capable of as engineers and engineering firms is, is using that technical background 
to help people arrive at a common set of facts, you know, that, that we face. Mm -hmm. um, but what we need to do differently uh, to, to create a greater impact is to combine that technical skill, technical background with this a new set of leadership skills, you yeah. know, the, uh, the ability to uh, think system wide rather than just solely focusing on a project to get mm -hmm. to what you posed or and what Darshan posed is what are the people that are impacted mm -hmm. beyond just the limits of a project? You know, mm -hmm. so being able to look at the systems that we operate in better, uh, collaborating uh, better with uh, new types of experts, um, technological experts, sociological experts, economic, mm -hmm. uh, being better able to communicate with uh, the public mm -hmm. and, and new voices that are impacted by our work, uh, you know, being able to deal with thorny issues that yeah. have opposite sides, you know, but in, in getting the both the best of both sides. And, you know, as we talked about earlier, being better able to navigate in a leadership role in public yeah. policy. And, you know, to to build off of that and and tie this back to where you started your question, Jeff, about like, you know, how do we get engineers more comfortable recognizing these politically um, the political questions that are at stake here? And I think engineers can at some level um, rest easy if they recognize that the work they've done has always been for purposes, right? Policies are set, norms are set, processes are set all through political process. So even if we think about like the environmental impact statements or assessments that a firm has to do through the National Environmental Policy Act, that is a that you know that NEPA is a law that was put in place through a political process yeah um and the the project that the firms are proposing to work on um are ones that um are for a particular stakeholder right it's mm -hmm. for government or it's for a company and that company has its own values and it wants to see a certain set of things ha happen in the world so you know i think if and this is not easy to do, I'm not suggesting that it is, um, but if engineers um, can have a better realization, and this is where I think the work of ECL or Mike's work is so important, is making engineers more comfortable um, with this awareness that their work has always been for particular yeah. values, I think can um, uh, lessen their hesitance to actually talk about the politics of engineering. Um, because um, at, at some level, there's no escaping the fact that these are political questions and we shouldn't, we shouldn't escape that. We should learn to talk about our differences in a better way. Um, no, if we look at the history of engineering and if we project out to the future of engineering, it's all political. Yeah. Um, and so it's a matter of simply um, becoming comfortable with talking to folks who are not like us, who view the world differently, who have different sets of values, and and navigating those political differences in a constructive way. Yeah, it's just that recognition of you. It's never been a political or a historical, um, yep. as you mentioned yep. right at the beginning of the conversation, and just kind yep. of taking you from that point. You might not think you're engaged in it, but you are. Um, yep. And and it's it's something that's it, this is this is just we're just scratching the surface. I think that you know there's a lot more to talk about, and I want to have both of you back on uh, to to delve into these topics um, deeper because I think we can get more into environmental questions. We can get more into just uh, I don't know, just dig deeper into this because there there's a lot happening. Um, there you know mm -hmm. the, the landscape is changing both mm -hmm. on a societal basis and then also in the industry, not just our industry, but industries across all the sectors of the economy. And mm -hmm. it's important to stay at the leading edge of that because if not, then, then you're going to be at a serious disadvantage. Um, is there anything else that I, I, I know that we're up against uh, 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 the time, um, but is there anything that we didn't cover in this conversation that we want to make sure that we're across to our audience? Yeah. 
Uh, Jeff, no, thank you for the opportunity. As you said, we could go on and on and on, yeah. but uh, this is an example of the type of discussions that we're trying to uh, make happen through Engineering Change Lab. That that uh, uh, there are that, that there's great impacts of our work in the world. And as Darshan said, we need to take a more comprehensive look mm -hmm. at those impacts. Yeah. And uh, Mike McEachan, uh, he is the uh, um, Executive Director of Engineering Change Lab, and you can find that at ecl.usa.org. Uh, Darshan uh, Karwat is with uh, Arizona uh, State University and um, engaged with ECL's work. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at their website and check it out and read more about what they're working on. And we will be sure to have more conversations about this in the future because I think it gets back to the that that essential value to society question, which is one of, of course, organizationally at ACEC, it's one of our our main goals from a strategic plan, but largely with the direction of the industry, it's something that we have to really talk about uh, both in Washington and beyond the Beltway. The essential value that that the work our members do to improve the world and, and mm -hmm. find solutions to the challenges that we face, whether they're prickly political issues or more um, common issues to our quality of life. So uh, Mike and Darshan, thank you so thank much. You. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I want to, you know, sort of congratulate Mike as well on the important work that he's leading. And I'm just very grateful to be, uh, connected to folks like you, Jeff and Mike. Great. Thank uh, you, Darshan. Yeah. And uh, we'll make sure to have you guys back on uh, in the very near future to kind of go into this a little bit more because um, there's, a, like I said, there's a lot to unwrap. But for now, um, this has been Engineering Influence Podcast from the American Council of Engineering Companies. We will see you next time. Mm -hmm.